when the Pharisees had heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they said, I know what we'll do. We'll send a lawyer. This is, <laughs> you know, nothing ever changes, you know. Uh, they send a lawyer. And uh, this is not a lawyer from the Roman Empire. This is a lawyer of the law of Moses. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, and, and you have the motivation to test him. Oh, they should learn that you don't give pop quizzes to Jesus. He wins every time, okay? <laughs> Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus sh could have gone, duh, you know. You should, here it is. There are only two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbors yourself. You do those things, you got it. It fulfills all the law and the prophets. Is that an amazing summary of life? If people would live like this, it would be a world of absolute peace. That's pretty simple. We write rules and regulations and laws and precepts and all the rest. Uh, thousands of pages. If we would only do those two things, love the Lord your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbors, yourself, it would be a world of peace. All the Old Testament summarized in that. And do you notice there's one word common to both of those? What is it? Love. You know, do the highest good. Uh, you know, love is such a mixed up word nowadays. You have to recognize the Puritans like the word goodness better. Goodness of being, goodness of will, goodness of hand. In other words, you're a good person. That's goodness of being. Uh, your decisions are made up based on that goodness, goodness of will. And then what you do is an extension of who you are, what you've decided to do, and you do the loving thing. That's the way we're supposed to be. That's not complicated. That is not a bit complicated. And that's what Jesus is saying here. You want the greatest thing? Here it is. The scribe goes, whoa, this was a very smart lawyer. Most of the time they are. You're right, teacher. <laughs> That's a great thing. You're right, teacher. You truly said that he is one. There is no one but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Boy, this, that's a great statement. Here's a guy coming, representing the religious system. And Jesus has summarized the whole... Uh, revelation to Judaism in, in two simple sentences. And the lawyer, it clicks. The lights come on in his mind. That's a great, that's better than sacrifices. Yeah. Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. This man's almost across the line. After that, no one dared ask him any more questions. Is that beautiful? Just think how the apostles are feeling. Get the feeling of the apostles in this. Triumphantry Sunday goes in, cleanses the temple. All the enemies come. He cuts them off at their legs every time. Nobody's going to ask any, any more questions. Now notice, there was a time. Uh, do people still tell you this? Uh, the first thing you have to do is learn how to love yourself. Do you still hear that? That's a bunch of baloney. No man ever hated his own flesh. We all instinctively love our... You don't have to teach anybody to love themselves. The fact of the matter is, what we have to do is teach everyone to overcome putting self first because we love ourselves so much. That's the truth of it. And Jesus says there are two rules. You don't have to teach a person to love himself. We do instinctively. No man ever hated his own flesh. It's that simple. Paul says it. So that's a generalization that's inspired. Now, self-esteem, self-worth is a real question. I understand that. But it's only a problem because we do care for ourselves. And that's built in, built into the whole process. On these two commandments, the whole law hangs and they're not asking him any more questions. He's, he's answered every question they've had. Uh, this one with a near convert. And Jesus said, you all done? All done with questions? I got a question for you now. 
This is a simple question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And it's always great when Jesus teaches like this, they'll ask a question, they'll respond to it, and by responding correctly, they nail themselves. What do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said, son of David, that's simple. Well, here's a question. How is it then that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, calls his son Lord? The Lord said to my Lord. He calls his son Lord. Now, they, weren't, they wouldn't debate that's what the psalm says. David writes the psalm, and he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I put thy enemies under thy feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be David's son? Now give me a one word answer to that. How can David call one of his descendants Lord? Who said that? Where did it come from? Incarnation's dead right. That's the right answer. I gotta say, God manifest in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. That's the answer. It's so simple. And that's what they choked on. How can you, being a man, make yourself equal to God? You remember at the beginning when he forgave sins? It's still the hang-up. This question is beautiful. How can David, whose son the Messiah is, call that Messiah Lord? It requires the Incarnation. It's Christmas right at the end. I said uh, you should be able to enjoy Christmas a whole lot more as we have put the life of Christ uh, before us once again. He calls him Lord. That's what happened. We sing that joy to the world. What? The Lord, Lord is come. We sing, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Hark the herald angels sing that way. That's what we sing about at Christmas. And that's the question Jesus answers. No one was able to answer him a word. Why not? The answer is so obvious. It is very hard to be in an argument and lose every battle in the argument, which they had. The Pharisees, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees and the Herodians, the Sanhedrin, the lawyer, they had all lost. And then Jesus asked them a question and they can't say anything. How, how clear their rejection is to have all of that right in front of them. And again, if you're one of the disciples, you say, oh, Tuesday's a great day. Now the Lord on the Next page is uh, addressing the crowds and his disciples. And he tells us some important things. These poor people, these poor people who could not bring themselves to acknowledge the truthfulness of his arguments, the scribes and Pharisees, he says, sit on Moses' seat. They represent God. They are sitting in the, at the, in the seat of Moses. They are God's authority in things religious. And he says, consequently, so practice and observe whatever they tell you. When they are reading the law of Moses, when they are going through the Old Testament in their synagogue practices, when worship up to now is functioning properly in the temple, do what they say, but not what they do. For they preach but do not practice. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen of men. But did you hear what he said? What they say, do. That's a big lesson for everybody that ever listens to it. Have you ever to a message? Sometimes I don't finish my sentences. Uh, have you ever thought this when somebody was preaching? He doesn't live like that himself. Well, what's he talking to me about? Have you ever thought that? Anybody? We have a tendency. The fact of the matter is, and I've said this before to you, and here it is again, all of us 
preach over where we are in life. Higher than where we are. Our our public persona is always better than our private persona. Got it? And that's true of the preachers, the teachers, everybody. The only person it wasn't true of in all of history is Jesus. So, uh, we have a lot of things that go through our mind when we're listening to somebody preach or teach. If he doesn't have a, 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 a sparkling personality, we kind of doze off on him. And if it's not something light and fine and all the rest, we doze off. Uh, if he's kind of uh, stiff in his presentation, we... We kind of go elsewhere. Our job as people who listen is to listen for the truth and change our lives based on it. You have to listen through some junk sometimes. It's not there to sit there and evaluate, give a person a 10 and 9. It's not homiletic class to see how well you're making a presentation. What we're there for is to get a kernel of truth. That's what Jesus is teaching us here. Even if the person... It's way off base. Listen through it all. And you'll find something new. Something that will help you that day. Help you grow in the knowledge of our Lord. And if you come to a meeting with that kind of attitude, instead of saying, you know, how boring is this going to be? What's in it for me today? There's not a class you have at school that won't help you in the process of how you should live life. Even if some of them are bad sometimes. All the time. I've had some really bad teachers probably been that way from time to time. That's just the way life is. Jesus gives us a great principle here. You know? They don't practice everything. What they do, listen to what they say. That's from the Word and do it. Don't be like they are. This goes against the concept. People will say you can never rise above your leadership. That's baloney. I hope some of you rise above the leadership you've had. In your church, in your family, in the school. You can be the, the real person, closer to what Jesus is. Don't do what they do, but do what they say when they're speaking for God. That's not a hard thing to learn, is it? You've got to listen through. You've got to discipline your mind to listen through. You've got to watch a whole dumb football game for one good play. And we can do that, can't we? Well, we ought to do that in the Word of God, too. These people, he says, they love the public places, places of honor, the best seats in the synagogue, salutations in the marketplace. They love salutations. He says, uh, they love to be called rabbi, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, for you are all brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Now, we all call our fathers father or daddy or papa or whatever. That's not what Jesus is ruling out. But he is saying that there is one source of fatherhood. And recognize that. Don't think it's any big deal because you happen to share the name of God that he's loaned to you to bring honor to him. That's why we're to honor our father and mother. It's a loaned name. He says, you be like me. And don't forget to say... It goes back to God. Neither be called masters. One master. Let's all read verses 11 and 12 together. Jesus really knows how to teach, doesn't he? He, Let's read it together out loud. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Is that hard to understand? It is so simple so hard to do. And remember, you can tell if you're a servant if people treat you like a servant. They'll know who you are. You know who they are in this class. You know who the students are that you can depend on for help. And I know you know those who will turn you off. And Jesus says, be the servant. Put your hand, if your hands are cold, put them on your next page. It'll heat it up in a minute. This is a great page. I love this page. There are reasons I love it that I shouldn't love it, but uh, the Lord really gets after him here. It's beautiful. Uh, look at verse, uh, verse 13. Woe to you. Verse 15. Woe to you. Verse 16. Woe to you. Verse uh, 23. Woe to you. 
Verse 25, woe to you. 27, woe to you. 29, woe to you. Woe. That's a lot of woes. And, and he is so mad at the Pharisees by now. Uh, the phrases are, are followed by hypocrite. Hypocrite. This is the second time Jesus has done this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You've shut the kingdom of heaven against men. You don't enter and you won't let anybody else in. It's one thing to say no yourself. It's another thing to keep other people out, you hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, 15, you hypocrites. You're very evangelistic to make people uh, Jews. You travel across land and sea to make a proselyte. And he's twice as much a child of hell as you are. You have a perverted form of Judaism. They escape some pagan religion to be dumped into a religion that's a twisted form of truth. And they're twice as condemned. Well, do you blind guides, you have all these rituals. You say, I swear by the temple, I swear by the altar and all the rest. And all of that's to your advantage. You hide behind religious oath where God is the one who makes it all valid. 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you tithe mint and dill and cumin, have neglected the weightier matters of the law. I've mentioned this already in the first go-round of this, these woes. This is an important concept. Christ himself says there are some things in the revelation of God that are less important than other things. Did you hear that? Some things are less important than other things. The important things are like Ephesians 4. There is one God and Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, one Holy Spirit, one body, one baptism, one faith, one hope of our calling. They're called cardinal truths. We don't back off of any of that ever. We don't back off of the deity and humanity of Christ. We don't back off of inspiration of Scripture. Cardinal truths. There are some other things in the Bible uh, that are important. But your life, life's destiny doesn't hang on it. Can you name some of those kind of things? It says uh, on, on the first day of the week when you come together. Is it critical that it be the first day of the week? It could just as well be the third day of the week. The first day was convenient in that day. I think there is a significance to Sunday, this, this side of Judaism. It is the Lord's day. But the day doesn't matter. Jesus says that. All days are alike. If it's holy on Tuesday, it should be holy on Sunday. It should be holy on Tuesday too. So that that doesn't matter. Uh, summer keepers, the, the, the questions relating to diet, and Paul would adjust that. We've been hearing that they're not the critical things of Scripture. Whether you eat a pork chop or a slice of ham or a piece of beef or lamb, that doesn't matter. It, it's not important. But you adjust that uh, before people. Uh, one of the questions that regularly comes up nowadays is uh, is the role of women in church life. Uh, that's flexing right now. That is not the deity of Christ. Uh, the, the question of uh, head coverings, uh, a woman being covered, is a questionable thing nowadays. Understand, I mean, it's changing. There's a, a big difference between should I wear a head covering or is Jesus God? That's a much bigger question you understand. So you have to know where you, you will draw your lines of, of importance and what you will die for and what you won't die for. Now notice what Jesus says. There are major points and minor points. You should do both. And our attitude should be, I'm going to do everything it says in the Bible. But we can go crazy on that, just like the Jews did. And... Uh, he nails them. He said, you're big on, on tithing salt and pepper, but you're not real big on the big things like justice and mercy and faith. So let's not miss the big things. Do the little things, but don't miss the big things because you're so taken up with the little things. That's an important concept. Matthew 23, 23 is an important principle of life. A little bit of humor by Jesus. You blind guide straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. Imagine that. What are you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? Uh, you have an outside of the plate that's crummy. Uh, inside is filthy. Uh, it should be clean. You, you've choked down a lot of bad stuff with your theology. 
27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs. We've just come off a, a, a holiday, a Veterans Day, and we've seen many a graveyard, and they're beautiful, aren't they? They're places of remembrance and honor, uh, peaceful. Won't be, wouldn't be so kind of contradictory. They'd be great places to have picnics. <laughs> uh, always well kept, or most of the time well kept. But underneath, you, you, we're sitting on a spot where if you go six feet under, it's really not very pretty. And he says, that's the way you folk are. You outwardly appear religious, but you're corrupt inside. You're like whitewashed tombs. Ooh. And then he says, speaking of tombs, let me take that a little further. Uh, tombs are, uh, cemeteries are not only places uh, where you bury the dead, it's where you honor the great with uh, statues and monuments uh, to their memory. And he says, I go around Jerusalem and I see there's this prophet's tomb, that prophet's tomb, another prophet's tomb. And all it tells me is you're the descendants of the people who killed the prophets. Verse 31, top of 193, you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. And all the blood from Abel to the end of the Old Testament is on your hands. Then verse 37, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets, stoning those who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together like a mother hen gathers her chicks and you would not. Here's the statement. Behold, your house is forsaken and desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the second coming when he comes to establish his kingdom after the tribulation. I'm taking back the offer. You've said no too much. So he sits down opposite the treasury. This is discouraging stuff. Everybody has attacked him. He sits down finally after all these public confrontations and he looks across the way and there's an old widow giving generously. What a contrast to all these phonies uh, doing the little thing. And out of this comes a great principle of life. Uh, the Lord honors you not on how much you give, but how much is left. This widow gave more than all the rest of the rich who were doing it for show. So Jesus has, uh, has done his last public teaching. He's watching, and he sees the widow. And then he has another little encouraging word. This is a striking paragraph, 179, 194. We get these two guys that are always uh, serving other people uh, at the top of the page. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they came to Philip. Why would the Greeks go to Philip? What was that? He, that uh, well, the name is Greek at least. It's a Greek. Philip, no doubt, was Jewish. But his name is Greek. It means lover of horses. Lover of horses. Philip. Oh. Philip. That's one I want to talk to. He's Greek. And the Greeks say, we wish to see Jesus. Many Greeks, would, would many of the Gentile world, interested in God, would go up to Jerusalem at feast days. And here's a group of them. And the Greeks... Uh, come to Philip and say, we wish to see Jesus. We've heard a lot about him. Philip went and told Andrew. This is like the feeding of the 5,000 with the fish in it. Andrew went with Philip and they told Jesus. Look what Jesus says. The hour's come. Why would that invoke such a response on the part of Jesus that the Greeks had come? That's a big question. Hard question. Can you get the flow? You remember the Perea ministry where Jesus introduces a new theme, the banquet theme. What's the banquet theme? The Gentiles will be coming. Now go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in. My table will be filled. Many will sit at kingdom in the millennium and those who are invited first, the Jews, will not be there. 
but from east and west and north and south, from all over, they will come. And they keep saying, no, we're not going to the feast, not going, no, 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 they don't, they won't receive the invitation. And now, uh, Philip and Andrew come with the Greeks and Jesus, my hour's come. What's his hour? You see, he has to jump over the cross to be able to get to the Great Commission that says, go into all the world. Up until now, he had been saying, go only to the lost sheep house of Israel. Now the Greeks are coming. The banquet's going to be full. He's leaning in that direction on the other side of the cross. He has to jump to the cross to be able to, you know, to, to be able to the great, to the great says, all the world. Up until now, he had been saying, go only to the lost sheep house of Israel. Now the Greeks are coming. The banquet's going to be full. He's leaning in that direction on the other side of the cross. He has to jump to the cross. To be able to, to be able to, to, be able to get to the great you so and that says you so all the world you so up until you so been saying go you so the lost sheep you so Israel you so Greeks are coming you so banquets you so he's you so in that direction you so on the other side of the cross jump to the cross to be able to to be able to get to the great you so all the world all the world been saying go you so the lost sheep you so Greeks are coming banquets banquets he's in that direction on the other side of the cross to be able to get to the great nation that says go to all the world. Up until he has been saying go to the lost sheep of Israel. The Greeks are coming. The banquet's going to be full. He's leaning in that direction on the other side of the cross. To be able to get to the great nation that says go to all the world. All the world. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. My hour has come. Look what he says in 27. Father, shall I say this? Father, save me from this hour? What's his own answer? Is that what he should pray? No. For this hour came I into the world. I'll say glorify your name. And a voice thunders from heaven. This is the third time the voice is heard. Twice it said the same thing. At the baptism... This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That transfiguration, the same thing. Here, a different thing. I have glorified my name and I will glorify it again. The crowd didn't understand the words. It was for Jesus. <coughs> he says, now is the judgment. This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. They didn't understand it. Just heard the thunder. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Being lifted up from the earth was to show what manner of death he was going to have, being crucified. Now the harder question is, how is he drawing all men to himself? This is a response to the Greeks coming. He knew his hour was coming. He knew this pointed to the time when he would later say to his disciples, go into the whole world and uh, preach the gospel. In your going, preach the gospel. And they went and did that. When he says, I will draw all men to myself, he is not saying each and every man. He is saying all kinds of people, not just the Jews now. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He cannot be saying what he contradict what he said earlier, that unless the Father draw him, no one will come. And now say, all will come. The only people that come are the ones that are drawn. And Jesus will say to the Jews, the reason you don't come is because the Father has not drawn you. That's why I said about uh, Judas, uh, what I did. He knew who it was from the beginning. The drawing is from all sorts of uh, places and nationalities and peoples, not just limited to Judaism. That's the all. It's not the all that is all inclusive. It's the all that is from every nation and tribe. My seat, my banquet will be filled in the millennial kingdom and there'll be all sorts of people there. And we are a product of that. Uh, we represent amongst us so many different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we're, we're such a mix. I'll draw all sorts of people to myself. We're so glad for that, aren't we? And he said, that requires a cross. Because I, gotta, I can't say that. Later he will say, go into all the world. Not yet. Not quite yet.
The crowd answered him, We have heard that the law from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say he's going to be lifted up? And he said, Well, I'll be with you a little longer. When Jesus had said this, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he'd done so many signs before him. Look, by the time we get to the middle of 195, the public ministry of the Lord is over. He no longer speaks to the crowds. We're almost to the end. And here's here are two two statements. Though he'd done many signs before them, yet they did not believe in him. It was that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, hear this, therefore they could not believe. For Isaiah again said, hear what Jesus is saying about why they didn't believe. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes and perceive with their hearts and turn for me to heal them. That's why they couldn't believe. He's blinded their eyes. That's a hard verse. But just think what would have happened if he hadn't blinded their eyes. They'd have received him. There'd have been no cross, no salvation, no nothing. All of that was prophesied. We were there in the first class when we said these things are all prophesied. Is it a legitimate offer of the kingdom when it's already sewed up in prophecy? And there's a tension we have to hold forever in our lives. Now, God is working out his exact purposes, including the obedience and disobedience, both of them, of the people with whom he is working, which he has predetermined. It's a tension that we have to learn to live with. Can we all live with that tension? It makes us say, you know, there's a God in heaven who does things according to his purposes and I can understand everything he has revealed to me, but he hasn't told me everything because I couldn't handle it. And when I get to that door, I say, okay, I am finite, you are not. And we have to live with that. This is what Jesus said. Nevertheless, listen to this one, verse 42. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it. Even when the Sanhedrin, there were a lot of people who were believers. We know two. Can you name them? Joseph and Nicodemus. They'll show up soon. It will say they took courage. And they show up soon. The Lord blinded them. That's why they didn't believe. And look, if he can blind Israel so they don't believe, you remember all those verses that says of his disciples, they didn't understand about the transfiguration. They didn't understand about his death. They didn't. It was hidden from them. If he blinds Israel altogether, it's no big deal for him to put a little haze over the eyes of the disciples so that they can do the, after Galilee, they can do Judea and Perea with some enthusiasm. God's really in charge really is. Here's the final public statement of Jesus. Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees he, him who sent me. I have come as light into the world that whoever believes in me. Did you hear that? Right after saying, God's blinded you. He says that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my saying and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has a judge. The word that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father gave me authority. And they probably recoiled with that again. They hated that. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, 
I say as the Father hath bidden me, and I am done saying now. He says no more to the public. Put a line across there. That's the end of the public ministry. His summary statement is Israel was blinded. I speak with the authority of God. I came that whoever believes will have eternal life. And that's the final word. From now on, he just talks to his disciples and the judges. And what he says to his disciples is uh, the fourth great discourse in the life of Christ called the Olivet Discourse. I have a little outline for you. A couple of you would give this out, please. The Olivet Discourse is full of the Lord's return, and I've had heard so many messages out of the Olivet Discourse on the rapture. It's not funny. The rapture's not in the Olivet Discourse. Nowhere. Okay, if I'm doing... If I'm doing uh, with my left hand, this is my left hand, yeah. With my left hand, I'll do the rapture. With my right hand, I'll do the second coming, the Lord's descent. This is how it goes. It's up in heaven in both instances. You tell me when to stop with my left hand, okay? That's the rapture. Here's her. Here's the Lord's coming. Let's do the rapture. Where do I stop? Right about there. Where do I stop with the Lord's return to establish his kingdom? Right there, right? That's a huge difference. Ah, uh, that's the way it is. Uh, this is about this one, not this one. This is, boom, boom. This one is, and I'm here for a thousand years. There's a huge difference. Huge difference. Everything in the Olivet Discourse relating to the return of the Lord is about him coming back to earth, okay? So, he starts to teach. Now, in the outline, you have the basic elements of this Olivet Discourse. Jesus left the temple. He's going to go over. He's going over to a mount. Guess what the mountain's called? What? The Mount of Olives. That's how this thing gets its name. He goes out the gate, down the Valley Cedron, up to the east on the Mount of Olives, and he's looking over all of Jerusalem. And you can see the wall, the eastern gate, uh, you can see the temple. You don't see the Mosque of Omar, which you see now with that gold guy. Everybody thinks, you know, you think, oh, there's the temple. No, 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 no. That's where the Muslim worship. Okay? Uh, but that's the place. And they're looking and they're seeing all of that. As he left the temple, he was going away. His disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. I, I like Mark. Is it Mark? Yeah, Mark. Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And some of the, uh, as, uh, some spoke of the temple how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. It's beautiful. I mean, here's a temple. Whoa, they're all going, oh, why are they so excited? Why are they so excited about the stones of the building of the temple in Jerusalem? What's that? Yeah, that's their offices. This is where the king's going to reign from. As king and priest, if they understood Zechariah. The king and the priest would be there, and here's Jesus, and boy, how's it going? Triumphal entry. Well, let's do Sunday. Sunday is triumphal Monday, cleansing of the temple Tuesday. Bring on your questions, and I'll stuff you. And he did. They were so victorious, and they're all excited. Look at this beautiful temple. Look at these buildings. Look at the stones. Oh, they can't. And James and John are saying, are we going to be at your right hand, left hand? You know, this is a place. Jesus says, look what he says. What a terrible thing to say. Right? Do you see these great buildings? There's not going to be one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Wait a minute. What's that mean? And they go all the way down the, the valley, up the other side, not saying a word. And when they sit down on the other side, they says, what's going on here? What follows of the Olivet Discourse? They think they're home. And Jesus said, Tribulation's got to come first. That's the sum of this whole thing. Not there yet. Mm -hmm.